welcome to the second part of the CC++. Uh, before I continue with the slides, uh, I'm just going to comment on something that we discussed during the break. Uh, people ask me about Assume and uh, kind of how the expression in there is not actually evaluated. So I wanted to like just show a concrete example. So here's a function. You pass in an integer. And then you assume that if you increment the integer, the result is going to be 43. And then you return the integer. So what's going to be the return value of this function? What is this function going to return? 42. It's going to return 42, exactly. So what the compiler can do is it can say, well, if I were to increment it, it would be 43, but I'm not actually going to increment it. So I'm going to transform this into something that doesn't have a side effect, which is i equals 42. And then so you know, it's going to assume this. It's going to just say, OK, the result is 42. And then I'm not going to use the parameter. And so it's going to optimize it out to that, or it's allowed to do that. OK? In this case, it will never refer i. Itself. Yes, it will never return i itself because you're assuming that it's 42. So it's going to optimize based on the assumption that i is always 42. It's going to optimize the whole function out. And it's going to just replace it by 42, right? So obviously, if you then pass in 51, you're going to get a wrong result, right? This is exactly what ub is. How is the compiler getting 42? from that expression. Like well, the compiler's not proving a theorem generally. So so <laughs> I think current compilers are not going to do this, but okay. the semantics of the feature allow them to do it. Hmm. Uh, there's a question there. So you have, have an extra logic between the function header and the assumption there. So the compiler will throw all the logic away just to keep the return value. Yes. <laughs> yes, it just throws everything away, just gives you the return value. <clears throat> And so another thing about assume, people have asked me, um, you know, you, you want this no alias attribute. Like, couldn't you implement that with assume? No. Like, the reason we got to the assume align is because we can't implement it with assume. And the reason we need no alias is we can also not implement this with assume. I mean, I guess if you're talking about single pointers, you can inject assume this pointer unequal to that pointer. But no, no compiler actually uses that in the way you would think currently. But then, you know, as soon as you have arrays or things like that, you just can't express it anymore, right? Um, so, so um, yeah, basically we need this as a, as, a, as a separate feature because you cannot, in general, express this uh, no aliasing property as an expression that evaluates to bool that you can inject in here. Okay, so that's about assume. I'm just going to very quickly finish the slides from part one, and then we can jump into part two. So the last bit I want to talk about uh, when you talk about just efficiency in general and not necessarily real time was uh, kind of the cache. And obviously, there's like lots of talks about this. So I'm just going to very, very quickly just mention this uh, for completeness sake. Uh, we have this yeah, memory pyramid, right? We have registers and then different levels of cache. And then we have main memory. And every one of those is. Um, you know, an order of magnitude roughly slower than the, the other one. So you want to be, as much as possible, you want to work with registers and with L1 cache. And um, basically, everything I talked about and all the kinds of performance penalties that I talked about, they're typically dwarfed by performance penalties due to cache misses. So that is the single worst thing in most programs that is going to impact your performance, because a cache miss is typically hundreds of cycles that you're missing, right? So, so we got to minimize is this clicker work. We got to minimize cache misses. Uh, and so, cache there's data cache and instruction cache, right? So, you want to minimize data cache misses. Again, there's lots of literature on this. I'm just going to very quickly just give a high level summary. So, you want your data to be local. You want to align your data on cache lines that can give very measurable performance improvements. There is this whole concurrency aspect, right? So, uh, if you have like Atomics, then you know they're like typically. Uh, um, it, it happens on cache lines, right? So you can have one variable here and another one there, but on the same cache line, and then it's going to invalidate the whole cache line. You get this false sharing. Um, what you want to do is you want to uh, traverse data contiguously, which is not good for the, not only good for the cache, but also good for the prefetcher, which is going to guess which is the next you know, bit of memory that you will need, and so actually. You know, a lot of the time, it seems like we can throw away everything we know about algorithmic complexity and everything that you have learned in computer science. 
And, and the, the most efficient data structure is almost always something like a vector <laughs> where everything's just contiguous. Um, so um, we have all of these cache-friendly uh, containers. We have now st flat set and flat map in the standard, which is basically something which has the interface of a set or a map. But under the hood, it's a contiguous container, uh, which gives you worse algorithmic complexity. Right? If you want to insert something, it's like vector insert. It needs to move everything. But it turns out that for you know many, many cases, it's actually still going to be faster. I mean, obviously, it scales with the number of elements. And I guess eventually, it will be slower than just a map. But it turns out that that number is actually quite high. So for many, many use cases, this is going to be a much uh, better data structure because it, it minimizes cache misses. And then you can actually do the same with, with algorithms, not just with data types. So this is something that I learned actually at this conference that you can <coughs> By, by kind of changing the invariance of your data structure, you can transform certain algorithms into um, cache-friendly versions of themselves. And binary search is a nice example. So binary search is a very fast algorithm. It's good, right? But if you look at the pattern, how you move in memory, right? This is what a <coughs> binary search on a sorted range looks like in memory, right? So you're jumping back and forth quite a lot. And if you, um, if, if, if this, um, thing is not entirely in cache, it's like it's like a bit bigger, then you're gonna have cache misses there, right? And so if you if you draw like a heat map of how often on average, if you if you randomly search for some value, how often on average you hit a certain element, this is gonna be the heat map. And it's a very bad heat map for for you know cache efficiency. So it turns out you can transform the invariance of, of a data structure like this in such a way that the heat map of binary search looks like this, which is going to be um, very cache friendly. So you probably need to do a little bit more work because your data structure is not going to be just sorted. It's going to be some weird permutation of this. So it's going to be, it's going to seem that it's more work, but actually it's going to be a lot faster because it's more cache friendly. So this is the kind of stuff you can do with lots of algorithms, lots of data types. And this is what a lot of these people in gaming and audio, et cetera, et cetera, do. Uh, there is many talks on this topic. I just want to point out one because it was at this conference last year by Eduardo Madrid, who I think is actually also here this week. I know he's here because I've seen him. Um, yeah, so so he has he does good talks on this kind of stuff. This is a particular one where he talks about, <coughs> you know, optimizing the last nanosecond out of a hash table, but also he talks about cache-friendly binary search and all kinds of other stuff. So, so 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 this is interesting. And so we also want to minimize instruction cache misses. <coughs> And for that, we do need to consider kind of the code layout that we get, right? And so sometimes it doesn't matter for performance. You need to measure, but sometimes it does. And, and sometimes the alignment of your code matters. And sometimes there's this weird thing where you change some completely unrelated piece of code, and then you recompile the binary. But then because of some other change, the, the code just is aligned differently, right? Or something like this. And then, and then you get an instruction cache miss that you would not otherwise get just by recompiling the same code, basically, and then binary is slightly different. And that kind of stuff can be measurable. Um, and then for uh, that's the other reason to avoid branches, apart from the branch predictor that we talked about, is also that branches are also not good for instruction cache misses, right? So you don't want to have version functions. Typically, that's two instruction cache misses in one. Um, you want to use compile time polymorphism. As I said, we have deducing this for this in the language now, which is awesome. And here's another problem with the cache, which appears in some of these low latency real time use cases where the cache is guessing what data might you want to need next and what um, instructions might you want to execute next, right? It's optimized for guessing that. But sometimes, I think particularly in, in finance, but also in other use cases, the data you want to process and the instructions you're going to uh, uh, execute on the hot path are actually not being called or being used that often. So for example, you have a function that actually places the order and sends it to the exchange. And that function is actually not going to be called very often. So it's not going to be in the instruction cache. And the, the same can happen to you with the data cache. You might need a piece of data very fast, but you access it very rarely. But if you do, it needs to be fast. So you need that data to be in the data cache. And how do you do that? How do you trick the cache into not caching it out? And so there's Probably more approaches than this. I'm curious to hear about more approaches. Please find me and, and let me know. But these are kind of the two that I've seen in practice. For the data cache, if you need a particular piece of data in cache, you just periodically poke it on a timer callback, right? 
you just you just write, read it and don't do anything with it, but uh, you do enough with it so the optimizer is not going to optimize out the data access and then it's going to just keep it in cache. <laughs> and for the instruction cache, what you can do mm -hmm. is you can just run the hot path that you want to be in the instruction cache with some dummy data so it's not actually going to do anything over and over and over and over again just so that it's being kept in instruction cache. And I think, you know, for example, for, for these trading people, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what you want to do in, it, uh, in the end is you want to send the order to the exchange through your super fast networking card. Um, and you want that whole path to be in, in, in instruction cache, right, in your program. And so what you're doing is you're executing this whole path and then you have some kind of bit set somewhere, which only the network card understands. And it's going to go like, oh, I'm not actually going to send this. This is just dummy data. But for the program, it looks like you're executing the, the hot path exactly the way you would execute it normally. So it's going to be in the instruction cache. It's going to be warm. right? And that's how you mi minimize these cache misses on the hot path where it really matters. So there's all kinds of tricks like that that you're going to find uh, you know, in, these, in these industries that do this kind of stuff. There's a lot, there are a lot of talks. Um, about cache-friendly programming. I just want to mention a few. I think the classic probably is Scott Meyer's talk. Um, but there's, there's others. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just a few talks. Um, and there's other fun hardware problems. There's a problem of uh, CPU throttling, like slowing down, which is bad for performance. And so it can happen in, in different scenarios. One scenario that um, I heard, again, from a person in, in trading they had the problem that, um, you know, for some reason, the, 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 the program they were running, uh, um, it was very hard on the branch predictor. The branch predictor had to do lots of stuff, so it got really hot. And then at some point, the, because I, I think they also overclocked their CPUs and stuff like this. And at some point, the branch predictor caused all of this thermal, uh, 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 you know, it kind of was overheating. And then, and then the CPU was like clocking down to prevent the CPU from melting, right? And then that slows down your code. So what they did is they had to like, transform their code to kind of dissipate where the energy goes so it's kind of less heavy on the branch predictor so like the the kind of thermal uh, uh, energy is kind of distributed across the silicon in a way that that doesn't trigger the the overheating right so it's stuff like this where like you program with this kind of stuff in mind if you if you really care about like every nanosecond right and another example this is from audio this is something that i think was discussed also at this conference a few years back this is a friend of mine who works in the audio industry, he had the problem. He was um, programming something from a phone. And it was like a music app where, where if, you, if you play something on the phone, you, you need to hear like the piano or whatever it is playing, right? But then the phone has this property that if you're not doing much for a few seconds, it's going to throttle down the CPU. But then if you start playing at that point, then the CPU is going to be in this low energy mode. And then the, the, the notes that you're hitting are not going to be appearing uh, immediately, or you're going to get crackles because like the, the CPU isn't fast enough to deliver that information to you. Like You don't do anything, and then bam, you hit like 10 piano <coughs> keys at the same time. But the CPU is in this like, low, low mode, right? So what they did is they kept the CPU busy, basically, with these like pause instructions. Like um, I think on Intel, it's like MM pause. In this case, it was an ARM, an ARM uh, chip where there's like WFE instruction, which basically says, uh, tells the CPU to not do anything. It's not going to compute anything, but it's going to keep busy in the sense that it's not like a spin where it like spins and keeps hot, but it, it, it keeps it busy in such a way that the, the kind of controller or whatever is not going to throttle it down. And so they just had this on an infinite loop, these like pause instructions. And the that fixed the problem. What? The mobile people hate when the you do that. The mobile people hate you, yeah. But, yeah. but if you're doing real time, you, you got you to gotta do stuff like that, right? So um, yeah, this is just yeah to give you an idea of like what kinds of problems like we need to solve um, to get the latency that we need. So with this, we conclude the first part of the talk, talking about efficient programming, and we come to the second part of the talk, which is programming for deterministic execution time. Like, how do you program if you don't just want maximal efficiency, but you have a hard deadline and you need to be able to reason about your code? never running longer, or your particular function call, or whatever it is, never taking longer than, than the deadline that you have. Right? And so uh, the things that you must not do um, are you cannot allocate or deallocate any memory, because that has a non-deterministic runtime. Right? You 
do not know how long that's going to take. You can't block the thread. You can't do any I.O. And we're talking about the hot path thread here, right? You can't use exceptions. You can't. You don't want to context switch between user mode and kernel mode. You don't want to call any system calls or actually any code where you don't know exactly what it's doing. And you can't have a loop where you don't know how long it's going to be looping. You can't call an algorithm if you don't know like it has constant time or it has O something n, but then you know n, and you know that n is low enough. So how do we program with all of these constraints? And this is what part two is about. And now I need to just quickly switch um, slide decks. <laughs> Let's see if we get through all of this. I might, I might overrun by just a few minutes. I apologize in advance. Right, part two. So how do we do this? Let's first talk about programming without allocations and deallocations. And there is some overlap with embedded here in the sense that an embedded platform, sometimes you just don't have a heap. And so you, know, you kind of have similar solutions. But for real time, sometimes if you run a piece of audio code on a laptop, for example, you do have a heap. You just don't want to use it on a hot path. But you know, in, in the end, it's kind of a, it boils down to the same thing, right? You can't use data types that may allocate memory. So you don't want to use std string, for example. You want to use some kind of fixed string, right? You don't want to use any algorithms that might allocate or any data structures that might allocate, right? So how do we do this? Well, data types, it's pretty obvious. You know, Just make sure that you don't have any dynamic memory in your data type. Um, but then also algorithms. And um, I'm going to do a little quiz. Let's talk about standard algorithms. <coughs> So which standard, like, if you assume that the element type that you're working with is not going to allocate, it's just going to be an int or something like this, which standard algorithms might allocate memory, if stable, any? Stable partition. OK, stable you know your stuff. Yeah. Place merge. OK, exactly. So the standard doesn't say anything about, like, the standard allows for all of them to allocate memory. You don't get any guarantees like this in the standard, which I think is unfortunate, but that's a different topic. Um, but basically, the way it works is we have QI, quality of implementation, which means if it's not required to allocate memory, then we expect a reasonable implementation not to do that. And we trust that. And it usually works. But some algorithms have these magic words in the standard. If you look into the actual standard, whenever you see these words, you know you shouldn't <laughs> use it. It says something like, the complexity of this algorithm is like, if enough extra memory is available, that's like the magic uh, standardese incantation. It does this, otherwise it does that. And then whenever the standard says this, you know, oh, OK, the implementation is going to allocate some kind of scratch buffer dynamically. And then that allows a more <coughs> efficient, in terms of algorithmic complexity, a more efficient implementation. But in reality, it's probably going to be a lot worse because you're going to pay for the allocation. You really don't want to do that on the hot path. And that's exactly three algorithms. And some people <coughs> called them out already um, that, um, that have this property. So don't use, don't use any of those um, in, in, in low latency code. And then also don't use data structures that allocate. right? So you can use array and pair and tuple and optional and variant because they're all on the stack. You can't use anything that uses type erasure because that's always going to be a heap allocation, right? Stood any or stood function or any else, anything else that has type erasure. And we can't use anything that has dynamic capacity, right? Like a vector, deck, list. They all go into, or anything node based or anything with dynamic capacity because that's always going to be um, heap allocating. Yeah. I'm curious if you know why there's no way to choose an algorithm version with like, higher complexity, but which doesn't allocate. Why we don't have in the standard something where you can choose a non-allocating algorithm? Yeah. I think because it wasn't considered at the time People the STL was standardized. Um, I think nowadays, probably, I mean, really, we should just have a library that provides you those alternative implementations. I'm going to probably do that at some point. Um, yes. Yeah, in my experience, like. Uh, mm, the fact that the standard doesn't mandate whether or not the algorithm or the standard library in general allocates, it's uh, taking something that in some embedded systems you just say, well, don't use uh, uh, the standard yeah. library types yeah, yeah. Or, uh, at all. Yes. And I don't know, maybe it's a good addition to, con or something to consider at the, to, to the stand to the standard. Say. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
Right. So, so if you, you can't, you, when you yeah. said about type erasure, you, you mean the standard type erasure? The standard type erasure, yes. You can write your own. Yes, yes, I'm going to come to that. Give me, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have, I have a lot more slides about this. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, one workaround is, you know, you can, with these standard types, you can use custom allocators, right? <coughs> so there's lots of custom allocators out there. Unfortunately, like, Things like TC malloc, that's like the Google one. Um, you know, they're great. They're a lot faster than malloc. Unfortunately, this is a prime example for optimizing for throughput rather than optimizing for low latency, <coughs> right? Because they are really good for just overall efficiency, but they're not good for ultra low latency and real time stuff because they're minimizing the average cost and not the worst case. You no, know, they're not constant time. They might have locks in them. And eventually, when they're out of, money, out of memory, they will go to the operating system and call malloc. And this is exactly what you don't want to happen. So if you live in this low latency, real-time world, you have to pre-allocate everything. That's the, the only way, right? So we have some allocators in, in std PMR for this. A lot of people write their own custom ones. You have a you know, monotonic one, just a chunk of memory, and it's going to give you slices of that. You have more interesting stuff like pool allocators. Uh, frame allocators, the gaming people use arena allocators a lot. Um, and there's also this thing that I've never actually implemented myself, so I don't really have experience with this, but I heard from Anthony Williams, who wrote the concurrency book. He told me about this, that you can have some, some sort of lock fee allocator where if you run, if you, if you like go below some kind of watermark on the real-time thread, then, then another thread can allocate memory and kind of slide that in. <coughs> it probably is not going to give you this deterministic guarantee uh, you don't know how much time that's going to take, right? But I think in practice, maybe for some use cases, it might be a good alternative. And so with the PMR ones, or if you write your own, but then you <laughs> adhere to that API, you can kind of slot them into each other, right? So you can have a monotonic buffer resource, which as a backfill um, uses a null memory resource, which is the one that just always fails. So you have to do that. You can't go to malloc, right? And then you can wrap the monotonic buffer into a pool one, which Use the, the monotonic buffer as a fallback. Um, there's a few problems with this. It's kind of a bit cumbersome to use. Um, so actually, a lot of the time, um, and the stuff also has some overhead. So, so a lot of the time, actually, the better solution is not to implement your own non-allocating allocator, but to just implement your own container, right? And so there is something that's called a static vector, which is a fixed capacity vector where like all of the capacity is actually on the stack inside the vector itself. And so then it has a fixed capacity, which is like some size on the stack. And then if you push back and you exceed that, you're going to fail. And so we actually, um, there's actually this paper uh, where you want to get this into the standard. There are like a few discussions around you know, what to do with pushback, because it has slightly different semantics, right? It can fail. Um, and there's two very good uh, talks by David Stone from CppCon. One about like all kinds of variations of vector with different trades off if, if for these kind of use cases, and another one specifically about how to implement the static vector. <clears throat> and then you can do the same for these other type. I actually think static vector is a bad name because static means something else. I really think it should be called in place vector. That's my opinion, but anyway. Um, but we can do something very similar for all of these type arrays things as well, like that functional, that any. We can just say, okay, we're gonna have them uh, use the storage on the stack. Um, and then if you try to uh, store an object in there that exceeds that, that memory size, you know at compile time the type. You know that this is going to happen, so you can issue a compile error. Right? So, so you can have these alternative implementations. Be careful with the any, because it changes the move semantics, and that's the one that is actually in the standard very hard. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. The comment was that be careful with the any because it changes the move semantics. In the standard basis, standard basically mandates that any is a pointer. Oh, OK, because standard mandates that any is a pointer. OK, yeah, let's, um, let's talk about this later. I'm interested in this. I've not actually <laughs> implemented in place any myself. I want to, but I should look into this. Um, OK, and then okay, I'm going to skip this because we're running low on time. Um, one myth that I'm going to dispel is lambdas. Some people think that lambdas allocate. No, they don't. The standard spells out exactly what this should compile down to, and this will never allocate if you know, the, the, 
you know, if you capture something by copy and that's going to allocate, then you're going to get an allocation. But the, the lambda itself is not going to result in a dynamic object on the heap. Of course, if you then pass the lambda to another function and that takes the lambda by std function, then you might get a heap allocation. So don't do that. But lambdas in themselves, they don't, they're not going to heap allocate. But coroutines might. If you have a coroutine, if you call that, that might be a dynamic uh, allocation. So you can't, in general, use coroutines mm -hmm. in this context. So what, when you think, you can, what options do you have? So you can rely on the optimizer to optimize out the heap allocation of a coroutine if it can reason that the coroutine frame is never going to escape the scope of where mm -hmm. you use it. And you get pretty far with that. There is a talk by Ahil Zadaka about you know, how far you can get with this approach, but you don't have a guarantee. One thing that you can maybe do sometimes, you can create the coroutine, which is going to potentially heap allocate kind of upfront somewhere else. And then on a hot path, you just call it, which is fine. You can also write your own promise type and define its own custom operator new and operator delete to do something else that doesn't involve dynamic allocations. But it's very, very messy to do that. I think uh, Lewis Baker has like a blog post on this. Does it actually guarantee that the frame doesn't allocate? Sorry? Does it guarantee that the, the compiler cannot allocate the frame? Well, no. It, it's just going to use your custom operator new to do that. And then you can do something in there that. Oh, OK. okay so you just have to override like operator new for that type, right? <laughs> or like realistically, probably what's going to happen is that people are just not going to use coroutines. In, in low latency and real-time scenarios, which I think, unfortunately, is the most likely outcome, unless you figure out on the committee some kind of guarantee that they're not going to allocate. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing you can't do is blocking the thread. Right? You can't use mutexes <coughs> um, because you don't know. You have two problems there. If you take a mutex, A, you don't know when it's going to unlock. And the second problem is you get this thing called priority inversion, is that if the thread that holds the lock is a low priority thread, then your high priority thread is effectively going to have that low priority because it's going to be waiting on that thread, right? So you use this high priority uh, uh, and property of, <coughs> of your hot path thread. So don't use mutexes. And then how do we how do we um, how do we program if we can't use mutexes? And how do we do concurrency because we do need to get data in and out of these these threads. And um, this brings us into log free programming. So I want to I guess a big section of this talk is going to be about that. Um, so first of all, some terminology, right? So atomic doesn't actually mean log free. They're like two different things. Atomic just means, you know, you're not going to get a tear. You're not going to observe an intermediate state, right? You either observe before or after. It's indivisible and it's race free, but it might involve a mutex. Then there's the notion of log free, which means there are no mutexes involved. So with the mutex, what can happen is that one thread holds the mutex and then that thread goes to sleep and then no other thread can make progress. With lock free, you have this guarantee that at least one thread is going to make progress. But actually, in low latency and real time, that's not enough. Because you want to have the guarantee that your thread, the one high priority thread, is going to always make progress. And in practice, that boils down to having to write wait free code where all threads are guaranteed to make progress. So that's what we actually want to do. And that means we have all these beautiful synchronization primitives in the standard, and we can't use any of them. <laughs> right. So uh, we can't take mutexes. We can't spin on anything or and do anything like that. We can't use any of these primitives that somehow talk to the thread scheduler or do anything that's potentially unbounded. So the only mechanism we have is std atomic. And since C++ 20, we also have std atomic ref. And so we need to build everything just with those primitives. And additionally, on the hot path, we can't spin on an atomic. We can't do a cast loop or anything like this because it has unbounded execution time. It's lock free, but it still has unbounded execution time. Okay, so we can't build a mutex on top of this. Like you can't do anything like that. And and so you, you can also you can also can't in general use the atomic wait notify one notify all that API because that might also interact with the thread schedule. It might wake up another thread which no, is, might not be deterministic in terms of how long it takes. It might involve a syscall on some operating systems. Um, so, and the, the other thing that we always need to do is we need to write the static assert, right? That our atomic is always lock free because atomic is going to compile with any uh, um, trivially copyable type. But if that doesn't fit into like whatever atomic instructions we have on the CPU, it's just going to silently introduce mutexes and you don't even know about it. So 
how do we program like this mm. if you need concurrent code? And there's like two problems. There's if you want to pass data between threads, and one of them is the hot path, or if you want to share a piece of data with the hot path. Um, so we're going to talk about both of these cases. So passing data. And the go-to um, solution, at least in the use cases that I'm familiar with, please let me know if you know any others, is the wait-free queue. So in audio, that, that covers pretty much everything. So if you have this hot path here, somebody plays on their keyboard, you need to get these MIDI messages into the processing thread, you're going to do log-free queue. If, if you want to read a file from disk and then play that back, you're going to do that with a log-free queue. You're going to read like the file on, a, on another thread, right? The other way around, if you want to get something out of the audio thread, for example, you want to visualize your sound, right? Log free queue. If you want to log from your audio thread, you can't do any I.O., you can put it into a log free queue and then log it on another thread. And so, so this is kind of a good solution for, for a lot of the stuff. Um, but it's kind of, it highly depends on what you're doing. And find it kind of interesting and amusing that, so, so uh, on the committee, we're talking now about potentially standardizing a concurrent queue. And I'm like, what queue? Like, first of all, there are blocking queues, which for a lot of these high throughput problems, you might want to block in certain cases, you know? Um, and then if you talk about lock free queues, just about lock free queues, you know, there's at least 16 varieties of them. And there's, there's more. Um, but this is just from, from a brilliant talk, Real Time 101 by Fabian <coughs> and Dave. I highly recommend you check this out. This is just for like the regular queue. There's many other like variations, but just for the regular queue, you can have single or multi-producer, you can have single or multi-consumer. <coughs> and if the queue is full, you can either override the old stuff, which in, my, in some cases, you know, that's what you want to do, or you want to say, no, this is an error, because you, you, can't, you need to, like, the consumer needs to go through all of the old data, otherwise that's an error. So, you, so that's a distinction. And the other distinction is what do you do if the queue is empty? Do you just return the default constructed element, or is that an error as well? And depending on what you choose, you get all these variations that have completely different properties. They're either lock-free or wait-free on write, or wait-free or lock-free on, on read. Um, they have very different performance characteristics. They, they're implemented in different ways. They're, like, they're used for very different use cases. There isn't any, any variation that would be acceptable for a, a large enough number of different use cases that I would consider ever standardizing this, unless there's some kind of API where you can choose between different trade-offs with additional arguments, and then it's, you're going to get a different implementation or something like this, right? And if you talk about ultra latency in real time, uh, really, <laughs> ideally, like we want to have a single producer, single consumer queue, because we are not dealing with these use cases where you have hundreds of threads going on. We're dealing with the case where we have one hot path, right? And so the most efficient, straightforward, and completely weight-free thing that, you know, in audio at least we use all over the place is the ring buffer, which is an implementation of a weight-free single producer, single consumer queue, where you just have one pointer uh, kind of reading and the other pointer writing, and it's like, it's like implemented in a ring buffer. So it kind of goes around like this. So you never have to reallocate. You have a fixed capacity, that's a problem, but um, yeah, and so that, that basically solves, solves a lot of these use cases. It's actually really easy to implement. This is an implementation that fits on one slide, and it's completely weight-free. Like, if you want to put this into a library, you want to add more functions, like you want to like push a whole <coughs> range, and you have, like, I omitted all of these, like, move constructors, copy constructors, all of that stuff. But, but like, the, the base algorithm is just this, and it just, it's just one variation. There's different ways of doing it, but it's not, not hard. And it's all based on, like, yeah, and kind of a ring buffer, and then an, an atomic read position and an atomic weight position that you increment atomically. And that solves pretty much all of these use cases. So whenever you're passing data to or from the hot path, I think that's a very good solution for many cases. Please let me know if you know others. But then the other case is what happens if you're sharing data with the hot path? And it's not a stream of data, but it's like a particular value, for example, and the threads need to agree on what the value is. So then you're sharing data between threads. And, and that's, that's, more, that's kind of more interesting. And um, one very easy way to do this, if you can, is to just stick the value into an atomic if it's small enough. And the, an example from audio is a volume knob, right? So you have a volume knob in the GUI, 
And then depending on what the volume is, it's going to change what sound you're going to hear. But the sound is produced on the, on the hot path, right? So you have code like this. Uh, you know, you have the process, that's your hot path that's running on some kind of real-time thread. You take the buffer, you multiply every frame in the buffer with the gain. And then set gain is some kind of GUI callback where you, you read the value of the slider and you set this gain. Of course, this is a data race. So some people think that you can solve the data race by making it volatile. That's not true. That just disables <laughs> the optimizations, but it's not going to make it defined behavior. The uh, compiler still can reason about the data race not happening. What you got to do is you got to make it atomic. And then, um, I, I mean, you don't have to write load and store if you don't use custom memory orders, which you kind of have to uh, if you want to optimize. But like as a first approximation, you don't have to. But I don't like, I don't like this. I always put load and store there. Uh, so it jumps out at you that you're accessing an atomic variable. And then you see stuff like, for example, oh, you're accessing the atomic variable here every time around, but it doesn't change. Or it doesn't have to change uh, every, every iteration. It's enough if you use the same value of gain for the whole buffer because you know, it's enough if the gain changes every 100 milliseconds. It doesn't have to change every one millisecond. Nobody's going to hear the difference. So you can actually hoist it out right? because that atomic load is expensive. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to always, always, always assert that it's actually lock free with that data type and that the STL is not going to insert silent mutexes in there. And so on any modern platform, this is going to be true for int, float, char, bool, right? Size t. But sometimes it's not as obvious. For example, is this going to be true for complex double? On your machine, on your laptop, what do you have here? Do you, who thinks it's going to be it's going to be true? No. no? Who thinks it's going to be false? No. Okay, so it's interesting. It's called uh, double width atomics, right? So actually, all modern CPUs have instructions <laughs> for double width atomics. All of them. I think the last x86 CPU that didn't have it was like an AMD processor from 2008 or something like that. Like since then, every x86, every 64-bit ARM processor has instructions for this, right? So it should be true. Like anything bigger than that, no. But like double width should be true. But it's not, and it's very sad. I, 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 like, I wrote a long blog post about this. Um, so I actually tested this um, on, on all kind of modern compilers and tested whether that static assert is false or true. And it turns out all of the CPUs have the instruction, but some compilers don't emit that instruction. And that's very sad. Um, so and then you, you basically have to implement your own atomics to make it work, right? You have to use either something like Boost Atomic or your own library, which is very difficult to do, right? So it turns out that Apple Clang, it always works because they know that any Mac will have this instruction, so they're good. They have their own fork. Normal Clang on x64, it is going to give you those instructions, but only if you use this M MCX16 flag. And then obviously, if you have you know, the same type and one translation unit with the flag and then one translation unit without the flag, you get horrible ODR violations, and you don't want to go there. Um, GCC on 64-bit just doesn't emit that instruction full stop. It goes into like the, the, the library, like the, the libatomic, um, which might do the right thing. But like the static check fails. And I think the reason for that is that GTC really does actually want to support these pre-2008 TPUs that don't have that instruction. Because if you run the instruction on a CPU that doesn't have it, it's just going to crash, right? Um, and then MSVC is an even sadder story. So they know that compare exchange double width is there because Windows, since Windows 8.1, requires that instructions to be there. So any computer running Windows 8.1 or newer has to have that instruction. They know that. But the reason their Atomic still doesn't support it is because of ABI. It would be an ABI break to do that. And they're not, they're not doing it. So you don't get this instruction on MSVC if you use Atomic. You do get it if you use Atomic Ref, because that's a new thing. So there's no ABI to break. Ah, oh, god. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I wrote a blog post about it. Um, 
<clears throat> yeah. Um, and, but then sometimes, like, you have stuff that is bigger even than double width, right? So you can get around this by writing your own atomic library, good luck, or using boost atomic. But what if you have, like, more than double width and you need that to be shared between threads? Well, then you have a problem. This is a use case here, for example, if in my audio plugin I have this curve, right? And I can, with the mouse, like, change the filter. But then, and then that's going to affect like the sound that I need to produce. But then the filter actually consists of five coefficients. That's not going to fit into an atomic. I mean, it, it will. This is going to compile and run because it's trivially copyable. But it is going to insert mutexes into your code. And you see this in the disassembly. So you're going to have locks in there, which you don't want. right? So this is going to lock a mutex. mutex. And so you always need the static assert. And here, the static assert is definitely going to tell you false. So what do we do instead? And then uh, it becomes complicated. And then it depends on whether you're reading on the hot path or whether you're writing on the hot path. And depending on which one you do, you have different algorithms. But what you want is you want that operation to be weight-free, you know, despite your thing not fitting into an atomic. And so I want to just mentioned basically three approaches for the reading, write-free reading, and two approaches for the write-free writing that I've encountered. The first one is um, kind of, I guess, the easiest one. You can't lock on the hot path, but maybe you can do a try lock, right? So if, if you don't have to have the data, if you can have some kind of fallback strategy, well, if I don't have the data, it's fine. I use the previous value, and I just try next time, right? Then maybe it's OK to use try lock, because try lock is actually weight-free. Trilog is going to try and lock the mutex. If it fails, it immediately returns, right? So, so here we have this, this, this um, uh, biquad coefficients class, which is the thing that we're sharing between the threads. And now we have a mutex. On the GUI thread, we're locking the mutex if we're updating it, which is fine, right? This is not the real-time thread. On the real-time thread, we try to lock the mutex. And if, if it fails, then we just I don't know, do something else. Use, use the previous value, whatever. And so, yes, try lock is lock free, is weight free. Like, try lock is not going to lock the thread. Using try lock is fine. Question? But, what, but there's one thing here that's not fine. Yes? Uh, doesn't a uh, successful try lock uh, involve a system call? Yes, exactly. So, successful try lock. Does it involve a system? I don't think it involves a system call. But what does involve a system call is it's the unlock. A lock. What? It's a normal lock. If, if it succeeds, it's, it's, like, it's like you called a lock. OK. OK, good to know. So then you can't do it anyway, because the lock is already not safe. But the, thank you. I'll add that to, the, to my, to my um, notes. But the other reason why you can't do this is that the, the unlock is definitely also going to be a syscall, right? So you can't do this. I have a talk just about this problem, if, you, if you're interested. The solution is to use a spin lock instead of a mutex. And if you have a spin lock instead of a mutex, you can't spin on, on the real-time thread. But you can do the try lock on the real-time <coughs> thread. And if you, you can implement a spin, mutex, a spin lock in such a way that succeeding the lock is just one atomic operation, and unlocking is also just an atomic operation, right? And so that's going to be weight free. And so with a spin lock, you can do it. And then you also, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a naive spin lock. I mean, maybe you do if you just care about latency and nothing else is a concern. You can maybe use a naive spin lock, but um, it's going to burn a lot of energy. It's going to, like, the other thread is going to be spinning and spinning and spinning and, like, burning CPU. So what you want to do is you want to have a progressive back off strategy, right? You want to say the other thread, if it's spinning for a while, OK, maybe put the CPU to, pause for a bit and then try again. And then if, if you still can't get it, pause for a little bit more. If you still can't get the lock, maybe yield from the thread, let other you threads have to do their do stuff. Because otherwise, you'll invert priority. <clears throat> yes. And that thread that is trying mm. will just be at the top of the scheduler because it's the one that's running the most instructions. Ah, OK. So, so yeah, it's another reason apart from just burning battery uh, to, to, to not do that. So what you want to do is you want to have some kind of progressive fallback strategy. And in the talk, I kind of talk about how to implement that. And I also have a little library project on GitHub where I have an implementation of this. It's called Krill. It stands for Cross-Platform Real-Time I.O. and Low-Latency Library. Um, so this is kind of 
my little hobby project where I want to put all of these utilities. It's kind of very much still in its infancy. Um, it has the spin lock in there. It has a seek lock implementation in there, which I'm going to talk about later. I don't think there's much else in there yet. I have a few more things like on a branch. But I think in the future, it's going to be kind of growing and growing and growing. And I want to put more and more utilities in there, like also these containers and algorithms and stuff like that that I'm not allocating. So it's kind of a project in its infancy, but hopefully it's going to become a library where you know you find all of these utilities. But what you can already find in there is the, that spin lock implementation. So you can do the try lock. Uh, you have to use it with a spin lock, never with a mutex. You have to use progressive backoffs. The, the trade-offs are, yes, you get weight free reading, but you can only have a single reader, which is fine most of the time because you have only one hot path thread, right? But it only works if the reading is allowed to fail. Right? If the reader is not allowed to fail because you really need the latest value, then this approach is not going to work. And the other trade-offs are that the writer is going to block, as the writer is going to spin. And you can only have one writer with this approach, or multiple writers who then have another mutex, so you know, they're blocking each other as well. And so um, what do you do if there is no fallback strategy and you really need that value? Right? And so then, basically, every other approach is going to involve instead of having the bipart coefficients like the data type atomic, because you can't do that, to have an atomic pointer to it, because the pointer fits into an atomic log free. So you're going to be juggling pointers. And every, every approach, basically, to do weight-free reading is going <coughs> to involve these atomic pointers. So, so let's see, let's see how, how far we get with this. So uh, if we uh, have an atomic pointer to the latest value, and from the real-time thread, we say, OK, let's load the value of the pointer, and then we can use that. That's fine. And then if you update it, so then we have to like, copy the new value, put it on the heap, and then atomically swap the pointers to publish the new value. Right? So there's two problems here. right? One is, um, well, what happens if uh, we atomically flip the value, but then the real-time thread is still using the old one? Right? And then the problem is, if we, if we have the old one, what do we do with it? Do we deallocate it? But then we might deallocate it under the, re under the reader, and then it's going to crash, because there's going to be a dining pointer. Or do we not do anything? And then we're going to have memory leaks. So basically, all of these methods revolve around how do we solve, how do we solve these problems. Right? So there's one technique, which I call spin on write which is from this talk again. They call it a cast loop, but I think it's a bad name because a cast loop is just a cast loop. But this is kind of an algorithm that has a cast loop in it. So but you should really not call it cast loop. You should call it something else. So I call it spin on write. But yeah, it's from that talk. And basically, what you do is, OK, you, you kind of now, I'm introducing a unique pointer there, so we don't have a kind of lifetime problem. So really, I want to squash the atomic pointer and the unique pointer into like one data type, some kind of atomic unique pointer. I just haven't quite figured out the correct API for this thing. But I guess you, you can do this somehow. But for now, let, let me just let them here as two, two separate uh, uh, things that store the pointer. One is taking care of the lifetime, and the other one is doing the atomic publishing. And so here, what we do is we, we, if you use it, we swap. We, we kind of, instead of just taking the pointer, we need to make sure that the other thread is not going to delete it from under us. So we're going to swap it out with a null pointer. We're going to swap a null pointer into this atomic slot. right? And then we're going to do our processing, and then we're going to swap it back. And on the other thread, we know that if, if the atomic thing is a null pointer, then the real-time thread is busy. right? And we shouldn't delete it from under it at that point. <coughs> so again, we take a copy, we put it on the heap. And then there is this cast loop here <coughs> where we say, OK, if the real-time thread is busy, if, if it's a null pointer, just keep spinning. But as soon as it's no longer a null pointer, it means the real-time thread is not using the value anymore. And then you can atomically, with the cast loop, you can atomically swap in the new value and then safely delete um, the old value right? by just moving the new value into the unique pointer, and then it goes out of scope. And then you know, the, 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 old, the old object is going to be deallocated. So that works. Um, that is used quite a lot in audio. I'm curious if other people use this approach. Um, you can actually hide all of this logic in a nice ROI API, uh, which I have in my library, I think, on a branch. It's not a master yet. I call it the spin on write object, so it wraps a value. right? And then it, it, it like hides all of this logic. 
So you you on the real time thread, what you do is you do like a log read, and it's gonna under the hood do the swap with the null pointer and all of that stuff, and then you can access the values through this read pointer. When the read pointer goes out of scope, it's gonna swap the atomic thing back. It's gonna swap the null pointer back and the real value in, and that's all just in the destructor of this class, so it's hidden away. And on the other side, the update is gonna have all the logic with the cast loop and everything. And then you, you also can have another API. If you just want to modify a, a member, for example, in there, you can take a right pointer and then modify the member. But under the hood, it's going to copy the whole thing and then swap it back in. But you just don't have to worry about this. So this is a good approach. It's easy to use. The reader is always weight free. There are some trade-offs, right? Again, you can only have a single reader, which in many cases is fine. Um, reading is actually quite expensive. You have this two atomic swaps, right? You swap the real pointer value with a null pointer to tell the other thread I'm using this, and then you, you swap it back. It's like two atomic exchanges. That's quite expensive, but it is weight-free. Uh, the reader blocks writers. You can only have one writer again, and the writer needs to heap, allocate, and copy the value. So that's quite a lot of overhead. Most of the time, you don't care about the writer overhead in these use cases. But you know, the, I think the biggest problem here is that you have these two atomic exchanges there, which are Expensive. And so there is another strategy which I actually only learned about once I started looking beyond audio, which is called RCU. And so basically, uh, the way this works is <coughs> let's have this set up again. So we are, we are reading here again, but we're not doing any uh, atomic like swapping or anything like this. We're just reading the pointer. And then on the, on the writer, we are again taking this copy, doing this heap allocation. <coughs> And then we store we 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 store the new pointer uh, in the so we we, we publish atomically publish the new value. Um, but then um, we could we could reset it, but that would delete the old object, and we can't do that, right? Because there might still be a read. So what you got to do is you got to hang on to the old pointer because the the reader might still be reading that. And we can't delete it straight away, because it might still be using that. We don't want to leak it either. So we're going to delete it later when it's safe. Okay? And that is um, kind of how you do that. That's kind of at the heart of this RCU um, algorithm. Um, and so, so um, <clears throat> this is good. Read is now a single atomic load. So on most modern platforms, there's just going to be a load instruction. There's no overhead. That's great. Uh, we can have multiple concurrent readers and writers now. Readers don't block writers. But we need to solve this problem of deferred reclamation. That's what it's called. Like, we need to somehow delete this pointer, but later when the reader is done with it. But how do we know when that happens? right? And that is hard. That is really, really hard, actually. It turns out that the same problem, actually, you also need to solve the same problem if you're writing log-free data structures. So there are log-free data structures like the queue. We already talked about this. But there's also something like a log-free stack or a log-free linked list. And those things are, I think, heavily used in these cases where um, you care about latency, but also about bandwidth. And you have like hundreds of threads going on. You don't want to have mutexes in there. You're kind of optimizing for um, uh, um, kind of throughput like Google or Facebook or whatever, you have these like big servers with like hundreds of threads. Um, turns out that like for those use cases, log-free data structures are really good. Um, but this is the kind of the kind of stuff that you use if you're not doing this, but if you're doing this, right? I think. So in the use cases that I have seen where you have one critical hot path and it's just one thread, you tend to not use these log-free data structures. But like the interesting thing here is that um, because they're they're kind of slow and they're typically not weight free, they're just lock free. But the the interesting thing is that for to implement them, you have to solve the same problem of deferred reclamation. So for example, you have a lock free linked list, right? So every pointer here is actually an atomic pointer, and you have one thread who wants to delete this element. You have another thread which is ato like atomically reading the same list. Um, so the first thread might unlink this element by atomically swapping it. Right, but then the other thread, you know, might be still reading this, um, and so so you can't delete the element. You have to figure out when you can delete it. And so I just want to very briefly uh, 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 mention that you know there are basically three solutions to this um, 
uh, deferred reclamation problem that I'm aware of, and I'm going to put further again on the slide. Uh, I think I'm, this is the fourth of your talks that I'm mentioning here. Uh, so Fyodor did a talk about RCU at CppCon a few years ago, um, where um, he's going through basically three different, I mean, he's focused on RCU, but the point here is that there are three different uh, approaches with which you can solve the um, deferred reclamation problem. So one of them is atomic shared pointer, the other one is hazard pointer, and the other one is RCU. And so the atomic shared pointer turns out is pretty easy to use. Here is a uh, implementation of a concurrent stack from Herb from the paper where he proposed atomic shared pointer for the standard. We now actually have it in the standard in C20. And he claims it's the correct implementation. He's probably right. It's very compact. And why it's so easy is, is because it uses this atomic shared pointer. And it takes all this complexity away from the log free data structure because it handles the ABA problem, which you otherwise have. And it handles the whole kind of how do you. Uh, uh, like like solve the the lifetime problem because like it has reference counting right so whenever the last uh, thread holding on to this thing goes out of scope or the last scope goes out of scope that that has one of these things it's going to just deallocate at that point right so reference counting is a very good way of uh, uh, deallocating it exactly when you don't need it anymore turns out yes we have the atomic shared pointer in the standard but it's not lock free there. Like none of the standard libraries implement it in a lock-free way because implementing it lock-free is really, really, really hard. And I gave a talk about this last year here at this conference, what we would need to do to actually implement it. And it turns out it's very hard. Like it, it becomes a little bit easier if you kind of remove some of the kind of API of the standard ones. If you say, okay, we don't have weak pointer and, and we don't want this, we don't want that, we don't want like to know what the ref count is, then kind of it simplifies a little bit. But it's still very hard to implement. It revolves around this algorithm called a um, split ref count, which is kind of, I found it very difficult to get my head around that. So there is one implementation out there which is production ready, which is uh, lock free, which is in the Foley library. I think there's a couple more hidden in some closed source code bases. Um, turns out for us, where we don't want to implement a log free linked list, but we just want to wait free read one value, this doesn't help. Like so, so I, I gave a talk about this. Like that was actually my first conference talk ever, where I was suggesting that shared pointer somehow solves this problem, but it really, really doesn't. Um, one reason is that you could end up with the real time thread. Um, Kind of deallocating, like being the, the last owner of the shared point and then deallocating, and you really don't want to deallocate in the real time thread. So it's actually very difficult to like circumvent that. And, and so then you have to do other things. And, and like I suggested that it could work, but I was wrong. It doesn't really work. But the whole thing is actually really a red herring because the other problem is that it's lock free, but it's not weight free. Right? And it's actually really, really slow. You have these like massive cast loops in there, and there are slow. They are lock free, but they're not weight free and they're not particularly fast. So I wouldn't use atomic share pointer for this kind of ultra low latency stuff basically ever. The other approach is hazard pointers, uh, which uh, we are going to get in C26, it looks like, which is exciting. I think this is a very good low level utility for implementing lock free <coughs> data structures, which you might care about if you have a hundred or a thousand threads going on at the same time. For real time programming, this is probably not the right approach. It's very complex to use, but also it's typically also, I think, from what I know, not weight free. It's just lock free. So we end up with RCU. And RCU seems to have all of these properties that we need. It is actually weight, like reading is actually weight free, which is exactly the property we want. So we're going to get RCU um, in the standard too, like it looks like. It's on its way for C26, which is pretty cool. So it's easy to use and it's weight free. Um, and you can the way it's kind of defined in this paper, it's very good to use it for as a building block for log free data structures. Again, that's not what we're going to do here. What we're going to do here is you're going to use it to just safely like reclaim an old value if you're sharing a single value between threads, right? And so um, turns out there is a proposal for this as well. Uh, it's called it's this paper by Geoff Romer and Andrew Hunter. I think Geoff is actually here. I think I've seen him around. So we need to talk more about this paper because I think it's a great idea. It's basically just wrapping one value, a little bit like the stuff I showed earlier. And then so you can, you can use it like this, but then the old values are going to be reclaimed in kind of an, an RCU way. Um, and I think it's, it's a great idea, but 
First of all, I really don't like the name they chose. They call it Snapshot Pointer. I think it's a horrible name. Um, it doesn't really tell me what this does. And I think the API that they chose, I, I do have some disagreements. So we need to talk about this. Um, I implemented this myself as well. So um, somewhat differently, I call it defer reclaim object. If somebody has a better name, let me know. But at least I think this is a little bit more descriptive. It's an object for which values have deferred reclamation, right? And so uh, if we implement this, um, you know, we, we again have this, this thing where we can get a read pointer, and then it's an RRI thing. And then on the right side, we just update. And the whole logic of how the RCU is going to reclaim uh, the old values is kind of hidden in the implementation. And it is hard. It involves another, um, like one particular implementation strategy that I use that works well with, for the problems that, that I had. Um, is called, is based on a thing called an epoch counter. So you need to keep track of like which reader was at which epoch by the time, you know, it was using this object. And so then later you can kind of reason about when you can delete the object and stuff like that. If there's no readers that are on the same epoch, so so it's it's not trivial to implement. I don't have time to talk about this now, but it is possible, and there's a bunch of libraries out there that have done it. So it's kind of existing practice. For real time in particular, I would not do it the way they've done it because the way the way they do it is kind of also the way the RCU proposal does it is the reclamation happens somewhere on a background thread at some point when it's safe, and you don't really have any control over that which is fine in a scenario where you have 100 threads going. In a scenario where you have real-time constraints in a constrained environment, you want to control exactly when a reclamation happens and when and on what thread. So I added this, this API where you can like reclaim the old values at that point in time. So you can put like a timer, you can put your own thread and you can control when that's going to happen. So that's kind of what, what I need for some of these use cases that these proposals also don't have. I did a talk about all of this um, at last year's Audio Developer Conference. Mm -hmm. It's a talk just about how to do this. So there, I'm going to explain. I'm explaining mm -hmm. there also the whole thing about the epoch counter and stuff like that. Um, so if you do this, um, reading is always weight free. And now the reading is just a single atomic load, which is basically just a load. So you don't have any overhead there. You can have multiple readers. It's a lot simpler if you have one reader, but you can have multiple readers. Readers do not block writers anymore. The trade-off is that the writer needs to do this heap allocation and copy. And then you need to manage the reclamation. Or maybe not, but then it's going to be on a thread somewhere. But you have to worry about it, or your implementation has to worry about it. There is a slightly different variation of this algorithm. Uh, whenever you don't care about the reader blocking the writer, because the writer is just an unimportant thread that can take its time, there is a different version of this, where like instead of having this deferred reclamation, you reclaim the old value when you write. And it's a little bit similar to like the spin on write approach that we, we saw before, but it's actually a lot better. Um, and the way um, yeah, I call this reclaim on write object, I saw something out there where they call it, or something very similar, uh, the left write algorithm. So there you basically have kind of two slots. And yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explain like how this works, but like the implementation looks similar. You also have this, this, this epoch <coughs> counter and stuff, but um, Basically, the trade-off is the writer now has to wait for active readers to finish, but the writing is now fast. It doesn't require this heap allocation, and there's no need to manage the reclamation either. And the, but the API is very similar. So, so that's an alternative algorithm that, that, especially on, in scenarios where you can't even the writer cannot allocate. Like that, that's a very good solution. And so um, those are kind of different approaches how to read log free. What, hap what happens if you're writing log free? And then there are two other approaches that I've seen or I've used also, uh, which are interesting. So, so here, basically, the, the, we have the shared value again. And then um, the, our hot path, which is the one that needs to be weight free at all times, is writing the data instead of reading it. And then you're doing, you're doing different stuff. So there's, I want to talk about two approaches here, double buffering and seek lock. So double buffering is one that is very, very popular in audio and I think similar use cases. And I'm very curious if it's used in other industries. Please tell me if you've seen this or you're using this stuff. Um, so the particular implementation I'm going to show here is again from this talk by David and Fabian. It's a great talk. Really recommend you check this out. Um, and the use case for this is if you write from the hot path, 
is things like in audio, for example, if you generate sound, right, that's like your real time thread, but then you want to visualize it. You want to have some nice frequency spectrum bouncing up and down. So you need to somehow get the data that you're writing out of the real time thread, right? And, and you know, you can do that with a queue, but then you would have to, um, you know, write out every buffer. You probably don't want to do that. You just want to, you just want the threads to agree on what's the latest buffer, right? What's, what's the most current value? And so, so the way you can do this is by having two slots and the writer just writes into one of them. And this is like an atomic pointer, which, which slot the writer is going to write into. And so if nothing else happens, the writer is just writing the next value into slot A and then <coughs> nothing happens. It's going to overwrite that with the next value. It's going to overwrite that with the next value. It's going to always write the most current value or the most current you know, buffer that you want to visualize like into the slot. But then if a reader comes along, it says, OK, Let's atomically swap, you know, which, which slot the writer's writing to, and then let's read from the other one. And then you're done, and then you're fine. And then the next time you swap them around again, and you read from the other one. It comes, goes back and forth all the time, right? So the way it looks like in code is if you want to write this frequency spectrum from the real-time thread, you have this, these two slots. Like, one way to do this is just with an array of two elements, right? And then you have this index which is the current slot out of the two slots that you have where, where like, the, the writing happens, right? And so um, if you're writing it, you have to load the current index and then read from that slot, right? So that's one atomic operation. Then you have to copy the data. So that's obviously weight-free. And then on the reader side, um, what we do is we swap the index and then we read, okay? Turns out, this gets the idea across, but there's two problems with this, right? One is, you know, there is again this like race condition thing where you might be swapping the pointer and then, you know, rewriting the value, but the, re the writer might still be writing into that slot. So that's one problem. And the, one pro the other problem is that you have an ABA problem here where if you swap the slots and read and then you swap the slots again and read again the second time, but the writer hasn't actually done anything. You're going to read old <coughs> data from before. So you can solve both problems. And Dave and Fabian go into a lot of detail about how to do it. They kind of build up the algorithm step by step. It's really interesting. I don't have time for this. I'm just going to show you the end result. You're going to end up with basically three bits in this, in this atomic. And whenever you have multiple things, you always need to stick them into the same atomic. You don't want to have separate atomics because then you get horrible ABA problems, right? So you always want to stick them into different bytes of the same atomic that you can swap atomically in one operation. So you have one bit, which is the index, one bit which, signif which tells the reader that there is actually new data. So that's get around the, that gets around the problem that it might read old data. And then the third one is the bit that, that signals that the writer is busy writing, so it shouldn't, the reader shouldn't be messing with this right now. And so in, in the writer, you set the busy bit uh, to say you're writing. So it's a little bit like what we saw earlier with the, uh, <coughs> where, where the writer was spinning. Um, and then, and then you, you, um, you know, write into this index, and then at the end, uh, you um, kind of say, oh, there is new data there. And then in the reader, you, you swap the index, but then only if there's actual new data do you want to you know, use the new index. And then you have this cast loop here where you, you basically spin on the busy bit. Um, okay, so, and then in the end, like you, yeah, you, you read from the, from the correct index there, and then you, you swap it at that point. Okay, so this is one approach. It's used in audio quite a lot. I'm curious if other people use it for other things. The writing is always right here, which is what you want. It's a very good solution if the writing happens continuously and, and, and the writing involves writing a lot of data. <laughs> the trade-offs are you have a single reader, single writer. The writer blocks the reader because it has to, the reader has to spin on a cast loop. And you have the overhead of copying the data both on the reader side and on the writer side. So if those trade-offs are not good for you because um, this is not quite the thing that you're doing. I found another algorithm that also gives you lock free, uh, sorry, weight free writing, um, which I actually learned from finance people, in particular from this guy, um, David Gross, who gave a talk last year at Meeting C++. <coughs> it 
about kind of similar talk, all kinds of different low latency tricks, but from a finance perspective. And he was talking about the seek lock thing. And I have never heard about it again. So I started digging. And I ended up actually implementing one. And I think it's really cool. So I just want to quickly um, explain what this is about. So the way a seek lock works um, is basically that you have a, a sequence uh, counter, which is an atomic integer. And then on the writer, you add one. And then you write your data, and then you add another one. Okay? And then on the reader, and that's obviously always going to be weight free, right? And relatively fast. It's like, yes, yeah, two, two atomic operations. And then on the, on the reader side, you say, OK, <clears throat> let's load the current sequence number. If it's uneven, I know that the writer is currently busy. So I'm just going to not read. I'm just going to try again. And you're going to do that in a loop, right? So if, if the sequence number is even, sorry, if, if it's odd, I know that the writer is here, right? If it's even, I know that it's not currently writing. So I can read. So you're going to read the data, and then you're going to load the sequence number again. And if the sequence number has changed, then you know that a write had happened in between, and you have to again try again. But if the sequence number stayed the same throughout, then you know you've read a valid value, because the, read, the writer hasn't done anything. Right? And so, so um, this is the basic algorithm. <clears throat> and now I'm going to do with this algorithm what I should have done. Sorry, there's a, two questions. Yeah? So you're reading data that, is, that might have been written, right? M might be written while you're reading. So you're basically doing UB and then saying it didn't matter because I'm not going to use it. Yes, and it doesn't work, and we're going to talk about how to get around that. Okay. That is exactly the problem with this algorithm. This is the idea, right? It doesn't work like this. Um, so the first problem is, it's not really a problem, but this, the first thing that you have to do if you write the stuff, which is something that I would have done with all the other algorithms that I have showed, but I just didn't have time for it. So I'm just going to do it for this one. You have to look at all your atomic operations. And if you just do load and store, it's like sequ uh, sequentially consistent. That's typically very expensive. So you actually need to go ahead and think about what memory order might give you better performance, right? And so it turns out, or what atomic operations might give you better performance. So you kind of have to optimize this. And you have to do this with all of these algorithms. But I'm just going to show it for this one. Turns out if you measure it, or at least you know, in some cases, the fetch add is actually slower than doing a load and then a store of increment one for some reason. It's two operations instead of one, but for some reason, Sometimes this is uh, um, faster. I think it has something to do with cache lines. I, I don't really know. If anybody knows, let me know. But like, apparently, this is faster for whatever reason. It's not the same thing. It's less atomic here. It's not atomic. Yeah, it's less atomic. But somebody else can come in and increment it. Oh, but you don't care because yeah, you're the only you thread ever incrementing this. Oh, so right. you don't this, care in yeah, this yeah. case. In this case, yeah. yeah. If you care, you have to do this. If you don't care, you do this, which is two atomic operations instead of one, but it is faster. Yeah. Because it's not the read, modify, write operation. Those are mm -hmm. the ones that are really heavy, like expensive, and they yeah. invalidate the cache line. And so because you know you're the only thread that's writing, you can avoid that. And then the next thing that you can do is you can relax the memory order. right? And that also gives you performance. So what you can do actually turns out that a lot of these atomic operations can be relaxed. And then what you can do is you can ins insert fences and say you can have one release fence and one acquire fence. And what this basically does is don't let the other thread see any of the operations as if they happened before this. And here, don't let the other thread see any of the operations there as if they happened below this, because that would break the algorithm. But this is like the minimal constraint that you need for this algorithm to work. But it's going to be a lot faster than the previous thing because you're using kind of relaxed memory order for a lot of these operations. And then, of course, the problem is this. And this is what I think you were alluding to. How do we actually write and read the data? And it turns out, well, so if you just don't do anything, we just do a plain write and a plain read. It turns out if we do the read, we might get torn data. But we don't care. Because you're just going to throw it out, right? We can we only use the data if we know the writer hasn't been interfering. But it doesn't work. Uh, because the C++ memory model says, we don't race care race. if you throw away the data. Like, technically, this is a data race, right? So 
we can optimize based on the assumption that it never happens. And you see optimizers actually moving this read out of this thing and like stuff like this, and it completely breaks the algorithm. <clears throat> um, so I've seen at least one implementation of this where somebody just kept inserting more fences and to con convince the optimizer to just not optimize this away. <laughs> so it just happens to work on x86. <laughs> Don't do that um, if you want your code to be portable. Uh, so what you actually have to do is you have to do the writes and the reads atomically. Okay? And so you don't have to read the data in one step. Like the whole read doesn't have to be atomic. But uh, it needs to be race-free, right? In the sense that it, it, can, it must be an operation that is allowed. So you don't have to read everything atomically, but you have to read like byte-wise atomically, right? So the operations you, you need there is called bytewise atomic mem copy. And we don't have it on the standard, but there is this proposal by Hans Böhm to add it to the standard, which basically says, do a mem copy, and it's not going to be <coughs> atomic in itself, but it's going to be race-free. It's going to be as if every individual byte is being read atomically. And so you can get torn data in the end. You don't care, you throw it out, but you don't have a data race, right? So the compiler cannot optimize it out of existence. And this is what you need to implement CCLOCK. And as long as we don't have it in the standard, we have to implement this ourselves, which is a pain uh, to do this. And it's not going to be as efficient as I think when compilers just provide this. Um, you can go deeper with this. There is this other paper by Hans Böhm, uh, um, like asking the questions like, how does all of this actually work with the memory model? It's a very interesting read. Um, but but yeah, if you if you implement this byte by atomic mem copy, which you can do, you can like basically uh, um, have like a buffer of atomic chars, right? And then you can just do an atomic store into, you can like mem copy, you can mem copy the value into like a buffer and then you can atomically copy byte by byte atomically, right? So, so you can implement it. I suspect that when we get that in the standard, this version is gonna be faster, but it works. So that's the C-clock. Writing is always weight free. It's a good solution if the writing happens more rarely and the data is not too large compared to the double buffering approach. The trade-offs are now you can have multiple readers. Before, you could only have one reader. Uh, the readers are lock-free, but not weight-free, right? Mm -hmm. So they might spin. Like if, if, you, if you failed to, if, you, if, the writer, if there was a writer in between, you have to try again, try again, try again, try again. The writer is always weight-free. And the other trade-off is in order to do this atomic byte-wise mem copy, that your data it can be large because you don't care about torn data. You're not going to use it in that case. But it must be trivially copyable. Otherwise, you cannot do a byte-wise mem copy out of it. Right? So that is, that is a one limitation with this algorithm. And then you have this overhead of copying all the data atomically in both the reader and the writer. Right? And so, so that's why this algorithm is good if your data is not too large. Because otherwise, that overhead might become significant as well. Um, so yeah, this is this is um, this is it. This is you know, five different ways to do reading or writing from uh, kind of a real-time thread. And I'm sure there's other approaches and like variations of these approaches. And I'm really curious to learn about all of the stuff. So I'm here for the rest of the week. So please let me know how you solve these problems because I really want to know. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the gener generic theorem and copy is nice and all, but in practice. Like adopting for a specific data, you might be able to, like, you know, it's like two ints and a double or something yes, like that. So yes, it's just two yes. atomic ints and an yes. atomic double, and you're fine. Yeah, so this is something also that Paul McKenney told me that um, they use lo like seek logs heavily in the Linux kernel, I think, for like the timestamp. When the kernel writes the timestamp, that's like one, one use case where they, they, they use seek logs. Um, and then, so. I'm using it for this case where you're reading a value of a certain type, and then you can wrap this whole logic into like a C clock wrapped object of angle bracket T. But then this is not the only case. Sometimes you're not reading one value, you're using like two or three different values in different places. So these like write and read operations, they can be whatever, it depends on the use case. And then you're perfectly right. Sometimes you can find more efficient ways to do this than atomic mem copy. The atomic mem copy stuff you need if you're reading you know, writing one value, which is bigger, bigger than an atomic. You might be doing something else there, right? This is a generic algorithm. You, can be, you might be doing different things in there. So very, very good comment. Thank you. Right. OK, so we talked about this. I'm done with concurrency. We have 10 more minutes. I think it, gets me, it goes, gives me enough time to whisk through the remaining 30 slides that I have. 
Um, I know it's a bit of a fire hose. Um, I.O. How do you do I.O. on the hot path? Because you can't just call stick C out. This is actually the, the, the easiest way to make like a piece of audio code crackle. Like you just put stick C out, hello world, into your callback, and then all you hear is right? Because the the yeah, it's, it's not gonna keep up with the with the real-time callback. So what do you do instead? Well, for these scenarios, if uh, you have to do I.O. One way is to just push your method into a wait fee single producer single consumer PQ, and then you pick it up on another thread, which is actually going to do, you know, the the output, right, the C out or whatever you need to do. If you need to do I/O between different processes, obviously you can't do inter-process communication because that again is not going to be low latency. What people tend to do there is use shared memory, and you gotta be careful, but you can do it. And if you need to be to do I/O. Um, with hardware, like you can't go through the kernel, right? Because that's that's. A, so what people do is you have direct memory access, right? You have some kind of way to directly write into the the memory on the hardware without involving the kernel or anything like that. So so another particular uh, type of I/O that you might want to do is you might want to read data from disk on the on the real time thread, and that actually happens a lot in audio software. Uh, imagine something like, um, you know, this is a piece of software that I was working on for a long time. Like it's called Contact. It's like the sampler sampling library. It's heavily used for um, soundtracks, movie soundtracks, where you want to do a movie soundtrack, but you don't have like a full um, orchestra, right? You can't afford that, or you don't want to spend money on that. And so instead of having a real orchestra, you have a piece of software that samples all the different sounds that the orchestra can produce, and you can just play those sounds on your keyboard. The problem is that those um, sample libraries tend to be 10, 20, 30, 40 gigabytes big. But if you're playing it, like the, the sound needs to be there instantly, right? So, um, so you can't like wait until the operating system goes to disk and reads the data, and it's way too slow. So um, there's two approaches that I know of to solve this. One you can do if the stuff fits into RAM in principle. It's just a lot, but it does fit into RAM. What you can do is you can preload it into RAM, and then, and then all kind of modern operating systems have APIs to lock it into RAM and to prevent that memory from being swapped out. Right? But then if your library is so big that it doesn't fit into the RAM, then you need to do something that's called disk streaming, where it's, it's a trick um, used in audio software where you basically preload into RAM the first kind of however long snippet, however long it takes for you to go to disk and a little bit more, right? Let's say 100 milliseconds. The first 100 milliseconds of every possible sound that you might be playing, uh, you preload that into RAM. And as soon as you hit the keyboard button and you start playing the sound, another thread spins off and starts you know, reading the rest of the file from disk and then through a log free queue kind of pushes that into the, the wait fee reader, right? The wait fee like reader that's like producing the sound. So that's that's one one uh, uh, technique to, to get around this. Exceptions is not a thing in, in real time and no latency code, right? As we know uh, from Herb Sutter's zero overhead uh, deterministic exceptions proposal, which I still hope eventually will uh, somehow make its way into the standard or maybe into CPP2. Uh, dynamic exceptions do not have statically boundable space and time costs. In particular, throw requires dynamic allocation. So we can't use exceptions there. Uh, so um, depending on what you're doing, either people compile with no exceptions enabled, or you know, if you use exceptions in other parts of your code, like the GUI, but not in the critical parts, then you have coding standards that ban exceptions from certain parts of your code. And actually, surveys show that about 50% of the C++ community falls into either of these, some, one of these two camps and is not using exceptions in at least some part of their code. So you could use error codes, like in C. It's ugly. It's efficient, but it's ugly. You could use std optional, which is nicer, but it doesn't give you any info about the actual error. So I think the best standard error mechanism that we have is now since C++ is standard expected. Uh, which lets you uh, basically throw errors, but with no dynamic allocations and very efficiently. And I'm showing how this works in, in this talk, uh, where I have a big section of what's to expected. I gave this talk as a CppCon keynote uh, last year, but please don't watch the keynote version. I, I gave another uh, version of this talk at Meeting C++ a couple of months later, where I fixed some of the bugs 
So it's like the more correct version. It's like version 1.1 of this talk. So please watch that version, because it's going to be more error free. Um, right, so, so still expected is a good, is a good way to, to handle errors. I'm curious if there are others. The other thing you really don't want is you don't want context switches uh, and mode switches between user space and kernel space, because that's definitely not deterministic execution time. So if you're on a mainstream operating system, like this laptop, uh, you, um, and you don't have any kind of custom kernel, you just use Mac OS or Windows or something, um, the main tool you have is thread priority. So you just, you just start a high priority thread. There's APIs for that. So in audio, we do this a lot. So we have this weird contradiction, right, where we do basically hard real time, but not an, on a non-real time operating system. So we just trust the thread scheduler to do the right thing um, if we set the right priority. And most of the time, if you don't overload your system, it actually works really, really reliably. But then also, you know, um, some embedded people, they use real time operating systems where you actually do have a deterministic thread scheduler. Um, and if you do control the hardware, you know you do have a Linux or something, but 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 you you are in control. You're not just doing consumer stuff. Then you can uh, do a kernel bypass, and you can do lots of stuff, implement it yourself in user space, or use libraries that use that in user space. You can do more, right? So if your hot path is in a single thread, and you don't care about the efficiency of any of the other threads, and you own the hardware, and you you know what's happening there, you can turn off hyperthreading, you know, which is going to uh, uh, release some of the hardware contention on your hot path. And then you can also pin your hot path thread to one CPU core, so it's not going to be swapped to another CPU core. Sys calls. You can't do it, right? So you have to do everything with user space libraries. I believe the finance people have these libraries that like, let you talk to the network card, completely bypassing the kernel, just in user space. And there's another thing that I learned about recently. It's apparently Linux now has an API, <laughs> IOU ring, where you can actually do syscalls kind of without uh, compromising latency. And the way this works is that they have like these two uh, kind of lock free queues in there, one for like the thread requesting the syscalls and, and the other one for um, kind of the operating system to put the result into. So that's interesting. I, I haven't explored that yet, but that might be, that might be something that might be useful sometimes. And then um, the last, the very last thing is this, right? You you you, you got to like be careful, like the algorithms that you call uh, um, that they don't have a kind of you, you know exactly like the upper bound that they have, and you know that this upper bound is within your limits. And and one example I want to give is is random random numbers. So uh, this is something that sometimes you might want to do on on a low latency path. Like for example, in audio we sometimes generate noise, which is random numbers. So we like, there's a thing called humanizer, where it like just kind of randomly moves sounds around a little bit more. So it sounds a little bit more like a human would have played it. So how do we do random number generation in, in real time? And this is something I saw um, actually in many, many code bases. So this is horribly wrong. First of all, so, so what we're doing is we want to generate uh, random numbers in the interval, half open interval between 0 and 1. This is actually failing to do that. It can return 1, so there's a bug there. Um, but the bigger problem is, of course, the rand. And the problem here is not that std rand is a low quality random number generator, because in a lot of these cases, we don't care about the quality of the random numbers too much. Like, we just want to produce noise, for example. It doesn't have to be cryptographically secure or anything like this. It just has to be random enough. So, so that's fine, but there's two other problems with Stutterrand. <clears throat> the standard says that it's not portable, which means you're going to get a different sequence on, on every operating system, which is bad because then you can't write unit tests for it. And then the other thing that's really bad is that its implementation defined whether the RAND function may introduce data races. And whenever you see this incantation in the standard, it means that the implementation may have a lock in there because if some other function somewhere in a standard library tries to call std rand internally, it might, get a, it might take a lock. So, so you don't want to use that. Um, we have uh, three random number generators in C++. Well, can we reason about how long they're going to take to execute? The standard says they have amortized constant complexity. <clears throat> so it means that you know, if you take something like the Mazent twister, most of the time, 
it's going to you know, take some time to, to compute its results. But every once in a while, it's going to reconfigure its internal state, and it's going to take forever. right? And you don't want that to happen on your, on your hot path. So here's a conversation I had um, on, on Twitter about this topic. I'm just going to leave this, leave this there um, while I take a sip of water. Right, so with everything you do, whether it's random number or something else, you really need to look at everything that's happening in that code and figure out if it's real time safe or it has like a deterministic upper bound of how long it can run. For random numbers, <clears throat> you know, somebody looked into this. There's a brilliant talk by Roth Michaels about basically uh, very fast random numbers when you don't care about you know, cryptographic security. And, and he's also coming from an audio background, so that's. That was an interesting talk. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of all I have. Like The last thing I want to say is that uh, on the committee, as I'm sure many of you know, we do have a study group um, that is uh, comprised of people who are interested in gaming, in uh, uh, embedded, in, in finance. And I'm the weird audio guy there. And, uh, but like we're all interested in the same things. And we're looking at a lot of these use cases that we looked at. right? And so. Um, one thing that I want to do is I want to maybe attend this group a bit more regularly than I did in the past. Um, and whenever they're like start trying to like discussing proposals that are in this space, um, I want to maybe help a little bit to get those things into the standard because we like a lot of the stuff. There are utilities like static vector, for example, that are useful to a lot of people, and I think we should really have these things in the standard. And another thing that I, I want to do is I want to use my little hobby library here to implement versions of this kind of stuff to like make sure that the API is correct. So whenever SG14 discusses a new proposal about like a lock-free whatever or like a low latency whatever, I'm just going <coughs> to go ahead and see if I can implement this. And hopefully, um, you know, we, can, we can learn from that. And then hopefully, some of the stuff is going to make its way into the standard. So um, this is all future work um, that I'm going to do in my copious free time. But um, yeah, let's see. Hopefully, it's going to be useful. So, so this is all I have. Thank you very much for listening. And before I let you go for lunch, I'm going to say one last thing. Um, there was a conference in the UK in June uh, where I'm going to have another talk about a completely different topic. I'm also doing a safety talk. I know everybody's doing safety talks. I'm going to do one as well. And for this talk, I'm doing a little survey. I'm doing a survey about undefined behavior and what it means for you. And I'm going to reveal the results of the survey at that talk in June. <clears throat> and so for that, I would love it if you could help me out by answering three simple questions. And one of them is optional. So you really need to answer two simple questions. Uh, I don't collect your email or anything like this. It's completely anonymous. So please go to humor.audio slash survey or just scan this QR code and, and um, fill in the form. And it would really help me out, because then I would have more data for this little survey, it's going to be more representative. And um, yeah, it's fun. I've, I've already looked at kind of intermediate results. It's going to be interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm going to reveal the results in June at CPNC. And with that, I'm actually done. Thank you very much. Thank you.